Hello again. Paul in Ephesus, in John Stott's commentary on Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 8, how did Paul go about evangelizing in Ephesus? The pattern of Paul's evangelistic ministry in Ephesus was similar to that in Corinth. First, Paul entered the synagogue, where he was already known. He had already made an appearance in Ephesus back in chapter 18, verse 19. And he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively, the RSV has arguing and pleading, about the kingdom of God, according to verse 8. To argue from the Old Testament scriptures about the kingdom is the same as to argue that Jesus is the Christ, since it is Jesus the Christ who inaugurated the kingdom. But, as in Corinth, so in Ephesus, the Jewish people rejected the good news. Some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, as Christian discipleship is again called, since Christianity was for the disciples the way of all ways in which to walk. As a direct result of this stubborn opposition in the synagogue, Paul left them. Now, before we go on in Stas' discussion, he has a footnote about the use of this term, the way. He says, it is interesting that Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, or Taoism, Judaism, and Islam, all in differing degrees, use the imagery of the way or the path. In the Bible, too, we are confronted by two ways between which to choose, usually between life and death. And he references Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and following verses, and Psalms and Proverbs, as well as, of course, the familiar text from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, narrow is the way, etc. He goes on, the Qumran community was also familiar with this alternative. But the six occurrences of the way in Acts are all unqualified. The origin of this absolute use is not known. It may go back to Jesus' claim to be the only way to the Father. Or it may be declaring that to follow Christ is a uniquely adventurous journey. So we must be agnostic as to the, the, the reason this this word caught on and, and, and also the reason it, it faded after a generation or two. He goes on, he also took the disciples with him, that is after he left the synagogue, and had discussions, that is argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, verse 9. The, in fact, this new outreach to the Gentiles in the form of dialogue evangelism went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God, according to verse 10. It is a bit tantalizing that Luke tells us nothing about Tyrannus. One assumes that he was a philosopher or educator of some kind who lectured during the cool hours of the morning but was prepared to rent his school or lecture hall to the Christian evangelist during the heat of the day. Since tyrannos means a despot or tyrant, one wonders idly if this was the, the name his parents gave him, or the name his pupils gave him. What is clear is that Paul's daily Christian lecturing for two years led to the evangelization, evangelization of the whole province. And then he has a subhead, Some Power Encounters. In Corinth, Christ encouraged his apostle and endorsed his teaching through a night vision. In Ephesus, through signs and wonders by which Christ's power over disease demon possession, and magic was demonstrated. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, according to verse 11. Handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him, the sweat rags being used for tying around his head and the aprons for tying around his waist while he was engaging in his tent making, perhaps. They were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them, according to verse 12. Liberal commentators are embarrassed by these verses and tend to dismiss them as legendary. At least four points may be made on the other side. First, Luke himself is not content to describe these events as mere miracles, demonstrations of divine power. He adds the adjective tikusas, which is variously translated special, singular, remarkable, and extraordinary. He does not regard them as typical, even for miracles. Secondly, he does not regard them as magic either, for he sets them apart from the magical practices which Ephesian believers were soon to confess and renounce as evil. Thirdly, the wisest attitude to the sweat rag miracles is neither that of the skeptics, who declare them spurious, nor that of the mimics, who try to copy them, 
like those American televangelists who offer to send to the sick handkerchiefs which they have blessed, but rather that of Bible students who remember both that Paul regarded his miracles as his apostolic credentials, and that Jesus himself condescended to the timorous faith of a woman by healing her when she touched the edge of his cloak. Fourthly, as in the Gospels, so in the Acts, demon possession is distinguished from illness, and therefore exorcism from healing. The mention of exorcism leads Luke to tell of some Jewish exorcists who attempted to tap the power they believed to inhere in the name of Jesus, with disastrous consequences. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those that were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, meaning probably that he belonged to a high priestly family, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. To be sure, there is power, saving and healing power, in the name of Jesus, as Luke has been at pains to illustrate. But its efficacy is not mechanical, nor can people use it second-hand. Nevertheless, in spite of this misuse of the name, the incident had a wholesome effect. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, that is, awestruck, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. The power encounter of Jesus with the kingdom of Satan was not yet complete. After healing and exorcism, came deliverance from occult practices. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, the drachma being a silver coin representing about a day's wage. We've already noted that Ephesus was famous for its Ephesian letters that is, grammata, which were written charms, or amulets and talismans, that these young believers, instead of realizing the monetary value of their magic spells by selling them, were willing to throw them on a bonfire, was signal evidence of the genuineness of their conversion. Their example also led to more conversions, for in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Then he has a... A short section entitled Paul's Future Plans, that is 19, Acts 19, 21 and 22. After all this had happened, after the synagogue and lecture hall evangelism and the power encounters, but before the riot in the theater, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, first passing through Macedonia and Achaia. Luke does not add at this stage the reason for this circuitous route, but we know that he was going to pick up the offering which he had been urging the Christians of northern and southern Greece to collect for their poverty-stricken poverty sisters and brothers in Judea. His eyes were not on Jerusalem, however. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. And beyond that, he was even dreaming of Spain, the most westernly outpost of Roman civilization in Europe. His vision had no limits, as Bengal rightly commented, no Alexander, no Caesar, no other hero approaches to the large-mindedness of this little, which is a play on the name Paulos, by the way, this little Benjamite. Meanwhile, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, ahead of him to Macedonia, presumably in order to make last-minute preparations for the offering, while he stayed in the province of Asia, indeed in Ephesus itself, a little longer, according to verse 22, because a great door for effective work had opened before him, and many were opposing him. Now that's a reference to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9, which, by the way, was written from Ephesus. Both the opportunity and the opposition necessitated his continued presence in Ephesus. I'll put in a link to our six videos on door-to-door -door ministry. Was was Paul's method, or the Apostles' methods, anybody's methods, uh, what we would refer to as canvassing?
did they ever, is there any record in the book of Acts or elsewhere that the early church canvassed door to door? Obviously, Paul in Ephesus was not, was not in the habit. He uses a synagogue and he uses a school. And by that method, the word of God travels around the province of Asia. So I'll put in a link to that. And there's also a PDF of that, the booklet from which those six videos were derived on our website, one wonders, all one word, onewonders.org.